Well, thank you and thanks again for the good oil conference organisers. It's a great opportunity for us to get in front of investors, uh, which is quite a chore nowadays. Uh, what, uh, what I would like to do in the, uh, in the short uh, period of time before afternoon tea is uh, just give you a little bit of overview uh, of the energy market. Now, some of you have been to uh, other conferences I've presented at will have seen this, but I think it's worth reiterating it. Uh, th there's a lot of talk about the fossil fuel industry being a dinosaur and uh, our industry being on its last legs and uh, we all need to learn how to uh, build solar panels, but uh, that's not the reality. If you look at the graph on the left, this is global energy use, uh, and this is from the BP Energy Outlook, the 2019 edition. Uh, it's a very, very interesting document for those of you uh, who want to see what's actually happening in the uh, world energy. The energy use is broken down. The bottom part is basically uh, r residential buildings, um, how we cook our dinner and how we heat our buildings, etc. Middle part, the red bars, is industry. Uh, obviously, that's uh, what we use to make things. Uh, and then transport. There's a little light blue set of bars uh, in the middle there, and that's called non-combustible, which is basically plastics. So we're uh, one of the big contributors to the uh, pollution of the oceans. But uh, uh, even with a major cutback in plastic, it's going to make very little difference to uh, energy use uh, in, uh, in a worldwide sense. The other thing you'll notice is that graph just keeps going up. Now, you know, we're all supposed to be cutting back on our energy use and going to renewables, etc. So why is it going up? The reason it's going up is 80% of the world lives in energy poverty. And that's basically using a base load of energy that in the first world we would take for granted, that we can cook our dinner and turn the light on. 80% of the world is in energy poverty. You cannot expect people to continue to cook their dinner on uh, dried cow dung and uh, their kids not having an electric light to do their homework. All the predictions are that energy usage worldwide is going to continue to increase. So where's that come from? The next graph shows you where the energy mix is. Oil, of course, that's where I'm focused at the moment. Uh, what that's predicting is that the oil demand is going to be flat going out over the next 10, 20, 30 years. It's still 93 odd million barrels a day. So if we look at uh, friends from Carnarvon who found the Dorado field, that would be sucked dry in basically two days by world consumption. There's a big issue here. Gas, of course, uh, is uh, trouncing coal at the moment and will continue to do so, and renewables are making big inroads. there would be the fastest uptake of a new energy source uh, in recorded history. If you look at the little graph on the right-hand side, which gives you a much better idea of the percentages, oil will continue to decline as a percentage even though the volume remains the same. And that's because gas and renewables are going to increase. Renewables come up, uh, are predicted to come up to about 15%, and uh, that's probably about where they're going to start to plateau. It's very hard to see how renewables are going to make big inroads into the, uh, uh, the non-domestic transport uh, and, uh, and, and into the major parts of industry. They're just not energy intensive enough. All right, moving on to what that means for us. There's two things here. The US has turned into uh, close to the biggest oil producer in the world. Uh, that's that big brown lump. And what's that? That's fracking. They fracked over a million horizontal wells in the US since the unconventional started. How many have we fracked in Western Australia? About 11. And we've had a moratorium up until a few days ago. There's been a transformation both in oil and also in gas. The US is going to be one of the biggest LNG producers worldwide. Uh, gas prices are going to uh, stay pretty flat for a while, I suspect, which is why we're staying in the oil business. So look at the last graph. That's uh, predictions on oil price. 
There's a couple of outliers that go up to $200 a barrel and one that goes down to 50, but the consensus is that we're pretty much where it'll stay with maybe some increases as we go forward. So where's that leave Buru? Uh, we've got a very big acreage holding, 5.5 odd million gross acres up in the Canning Basin in northwestern Western Australia. Uh, like our friends from Invictus, we're an experienced local operator. Uh, with, uh, with high permit equities, which makes a big difference to uh, your ability to get your uh, wells drilled and to control what you do. We've got good profitability underpinned by production from our conventional and Ghani oil field and a big exploration portfolio that we're uh, currently exploring. Underlying all that, we've got a very large uh, tight gas portfolio. Uh, was called conventional, unconventional, but when you look at that slide in the US, uh, the unconventional is now the conventional. Our oil production comes from the Ngani oil field. It's a very high quality reservoir, high quality oil. We have 50% of that and the operator, the other 50% is held by Rock Oil, or a uh, subsidiary of Fosun, a major Chinese company. We're currently doing 1,000 barrels a day. It's pretty modest. We're at the middle of a development program to uh, drill a couple wells and try and at least double and hopefully triple that. The field's profitable at about 30 US dollars a barrel. So at the moment, uh, with the Aussie dollar where it is, uh, we're doing very nicely. The development drilling program that's underway at the moment we're looking to drill two horizontal production wells in these very high quality fields. Vertical wells tend to cone the water very quickly unless you produce at low rates. So horizontal wells are the way to go to produce these wells, uh, produce these fields. We're drilling down to the top of the reservoir with, uh, with a, uh, a big powerful rig, basically putting the, uh, the bends in the wells. Then we'll drill a horizontal section in the reservoirs with a coil tubing unit. And the coil tubing unit is so that we can drill it under balanced, so we don't put any drilling fluid uh, into the reservoir. And uh, we're going to use Ungani crude oil as the underbalanced drilling fluid. So it's quite an ambitious program. On the exploration side, uh, we have a very rich and deep uh, exploration portfolio. Uh, the conventional dolomite play, which is what the Ngani field's in, stretches over about 150 kilometres. And we've also identified a new play called the Reeves Sandstone. And that potential has been uh, significantly upgraded by a recent exploration where we drilled called the Doxa. I'll talk about that in a moment. So we have a high capacity rig out there that's been drilling the, uh, the, the development wells at Ungani. Uh, and that's then moving on to the exploration program. So what's this drilling program been doing for us? We drilled a Doxa uh, with a 50% interest. That uh, is a potential oil discovery. There's an oil zone in it that we've completed on and uh, we're very busy at the moment so we haven't had a chance to get back there and run the completion and test that well, but we'll do that sometime in the next uh, few weeks to a month. Uh, the other well that we have in the portfolio that we wanted to drill this year is called Raphael. It's a very uh, large uh, dolomite play, uh, probably a, a pretty big reef. We've just run out of time to uh, get that drilled this year, basically, so we'll defer it uh, into the drilling program for next year. But we are going to drill a well called Miani. Now, for the geologists in the audience, um, they'll uh, look at this and say, what do you think you're doing? You're drilling in the low, not on the high. Uh, but this is a play that's been drilled and been very successful in North America. Why I'm excited about it is that the characteristics of, the, of this play that's been successful in North America are exactly matched by what we see at Miani. Uh, when they work, they're extremely good reservoirs uh, with very, uh, very large deliverability. Uh, it's about a 20 million barrel resource play. We've got 100% of it. It's a shallow well, uh, relatively cheap. Uh, and if it works, we've got another half a dozen of these things sitting inside the 3D. We're also looking at 
back at some of the assets that we've had for some time, one of which is the Bliner field. There's a uh, zone in the upper producing part of that uh, called the Yellow Drum. We think there's that the upper part of that zone hasn't been properly produced, so we're just back uh, perforating that to see if we can get some oil out of it. Uh, it's got the potential of several million barrels uh, at very low cost. Uh, we also got a nice surprise when we went back to the, one of the existing wells uh, to uh, rerun the completion and the well started to flow on us out of the original reservoir and it was flowing about 600 barrels a day until we had to kill it because we ran out of tanks to put the oil in. So that was uh, an interesting day. So there's uh, quite a lot of potential left here. Again, very low cost, right in our sweet spot operationally. The other thing we're going to do this year uh, is uh, go back and look at our, uh, our gas resources. We have uh, over a TCF of contingent resource in a, uh, a field called Yellaroo. Uh, it's tight, requires fracking. We fracked one well in there, flowed gas at high rates, very good quality. Uh, high liquids content, so there's no doubt that we have a large resource there. However, the fracking moratorium that the government had on has only just been, uh, uh, just been lifted and it's going to take a little while to get the regulations in place and get all the approvals in place to actually go back and do any of that. In the meantime, we're going to take a look at a couple of conventional zones that we encountered in one of the wells, Yellowroo 3, which will give us the confidence on uh, gas deliverability and also the ability to go and uh, develop a small scale industrial project on the back of it. Just to wrap up with uh, where our financials and corporates are, our market cap's about 110 million. We've been trucking along at about 25 to 26 cents. We just don't seem to be able to break out of that, uh, out of that band, but uh, hopefully some exploration success will help us do that. Uh, 30 June, we had just under 60 million in cash. Uh, we've obviously been spending some of that while uh, we've been doing our drilling, uh, but we're certainly going to keep a big chunk of cash on the balance sheet uh, through to the end of the year. Uh, there's about 20 to 25 per cent of the register held by uh, three uh, very large private investors, and uh, I, have, uh, I have just under 5 per cent of the company as well. So we're very, very focused on shareholder value. So just to sum up, profitable, low-cost oil producer with uh, control our, over our activity as operator, near-term drilling activity uh, on large prospects with large equities. These are game changers if they work. Balance sheet's very strong, good positive cash flow out of Ngarni, and uh, we're relatively unique in our sort of market cap in the sector uh, with production, the balance sheet and a good exploration program coming up. Now with that, I'll let everybody go out and get a cup of tea and uh, I'll be around uh, outside in the exhibition area if you want to uh, have a chat. Thank you. Thank you, Eric.